by miraculous we had just a couple of days back he came into the city he should not have been here he had an engagement on sunday uh, but he came early he is not a person who has so much time in his hands but we had rajiv cheladurai in the city and i must give you a few words about rajiv because there's no introduction in your brochures we had printed it a few almost a week ago so rajiv cheladurai is a corporate head honcho he's worked you know people used to say in uh, corporate life in india you know my father used to say you work uh, in tata birla you know uh, those are the biggest uh, names in in corporate life and actually rajiv has worked with both of them he's worked with the birla group he worked with the tata group he worked his way up till at the time when he moved out of the tata group he was the chief distribution excellence officer a cxo level in the tata group and then he left it all and he used his tremendous influence in uh, in the industry to start influencing lives in a different way he was already an author he had written this book called god's instructions for today which was an out and out biblically mandated book for the younger generation but then he wrote another book which is as popular in the secular world as it is in christian circles and that's called wisdom workout and in his own words as he write in his he writes in his book he says when you want to go to the when you want to tone up the muscles of your body you go to the gym but when you want to uh when you want to build your wisdom muscles your mental muscles use the wisdom workout and he does it with the aid of questions i just browse through his website a bit and you must go to www.rajivcheladurai.com and uh, you've got these daily bites also so i had a sample of that he does this through the medium of questions just as manoj was talking about questions being powerful powerful searing questions that compel you to rearrange the dusty furnitures of your mind wisdom workout known as a wisdom coach rajiv cheladurai put your hands together and welcome him to the stage thank you thank you for that uh, introduction i'm just hoping my wife could hear that probably get a little more respect at home <laughs> uh, so i'm excited to be here it's really um, i believe i'm talking to joshua as well i really believe it's god's doing um i want to speak to you about my life i want to speak to you about my story Uh, but the fact of the matter is it's not about me it's all about jesus uh, god has a way of leading people he uses different experiences for some it's success for others it's prosperity for others it could be victory but when i look back at my life i think god used adversity to lead me to him i live in mumbai but chennai is my hometown i grew up here i studied here uh, i messed up here and i met with god here so it's always close to my heart um being the youngest in a fam- in the family i have got two elder sisters comes with extra privileges for one i was literally my mother's uh, blue eyed uh, son uh, she she was the world to me she gave me confidence she gave me uh loads of love uh she she gave me self belief and she made me believe in the power of my dreams uh but august 2nd 1984 7:30 pm uh precisely is when my world came crashing down because it was at that time that my mother decided to take her life so as i walked into the room the the picture is so vivid and so clear I saw her lifeless body hanging from the fan. And I don't know why but I I I cried probably about one and a half minutes that whole evening and even the next day. I wonder why I didn't cry more. I wish I cried more. Because if I had cried more I probably would have vented and I would have grieved uh, I got the grief out. But I didn't. But with my mom passing away I was this Uh, until she was around you know i was really doing well in school high grades doing well in sport you know i was my teacher's delight 
But when mom passed away, so did my grades. So did uh, my performance in academics. So much so that my dad was a frequent visitor to the, to the principal's office. And I, and I used to think, maybe it'll make more financial sense if he actually got uh, what was called a bus pass in those days in the PTC, the Pallavan Transport Corporation. I don't think many of you sitting here were born in that generation of Pallavan Transport Corporation. Hey, but I didn't, I didn't want to tell him that because that would be the last straw. You know, but that was really my situation. With mom's sudden passing, I felt a great vacuum in my heart, a great lacuna. You know, my self-confidence just went away. My self-belief evaporated. And what was worse was the fact that I felt so unloved. You know, I, there can be no greater gift than the love of a mother. And I realized that the hard way. So in order to fill that vacuum, in order to drive away that emptiness, I did crazy things. I used alcohol, I partied, I got into gang fights, uh, you know, I did all crazy stuff. As young as I was, I was just about 14 years at that time. By the time I was 17, I was drinking regularly. You know, my life was a matter of concern to everybody around me. So, my, so all my well-wishers and elders, they were extremely concerned about me, and I don't blame them. So their aim was, how can we teach Rajiv one life skill so that when he grows up, you know, he'll find sustenance through that life skill. So somebody came up with this idea and said, hey, you know what, I think he's good in sports, so maybe we should train him to become a PT master. Now, no disrespect to PT masters, but that was the estimate uh, people had about me. I was growing increasingly frustrated. Relationships I counted to work didn't work. And I said, hey, what's the point in living? And there were a couple of times when I said, uh, when I attempted to take my own life. I planned the suicide attempt meticulously, but to my utter dismay, every time I tried it, it just didn't work. I realized there was a higher power. I realized that perhaps it was God in his own way stopping me to do this, and maybe, just maybe, he had a purpose over my life. I remember my first job. This was final year of college. I studied in Loyola College. Technically, I studied in Loyola College, but I spent all my time in the car park, if anybody from Loyola here, right? And I would fight my way to get my attendance at the end of the semester, but that's a story for another day. I'm not getting there. But my first job was to actually sell artificial jewelry when I was in my final year of college. I would borrow a watchman who I'd made friends with and borrow his cycle and go and sell that jewelry. I was paid 50 rupees a week. But that job taught me a lot. And more than teaching me a lot, I needed that money. I needed that money to survive. And more than that, I needed that money to drink. That was my situation. But despite the fact of the mess that I found myself, I used to read my Bible daily. I read my Bible not out of religiosity, but really out of a good luck charm, out of superstition. You know, you get this feeling sometimes, I've not read my Bible, something bad is going to happen. I used to be like that. I read my Bible, but as I look back, no matter what my condition was, I think God was so faithful and is still so faithful. He used to keep speaking to me. Many things he's spoken to me, but I want to draw your attention to three specific things. One, he said, even if a mother were to forget her child, I will not forget you. The second thing, I, I clearly, distinctly hear God speaking to me as I read my Bible was this, I will be your father and I will be your mother. And the third thing that God spoke to me was this, I will repay you the years the locusts have taken away. I finished college and, uh, you know, I was looking for a job. I got a job. And when I look back at how my career has progressed, I believe it was God all along like the chess coins that you see here were moving the, the coins on, on, on my life, which was the chess board. God in his favor got me a good job. I worked for a company with an industry which was new, which was paging industry. It made a brief appearance in India before the mobile telephony took over. 
So I, I, I got into paging as a corporate sales executive with a company called RPG, a good brand. I really wanted to work hard. I wanted to prove a point to all my naysayers, to everybody who said Rajiv's not going to amount to much. So I worked as hard as, hard as I could. But even as I worked as hard as I could, I realized I needed to get my life back to shape. I needed to stop drinking. I needed to make the right choices. But, my but I just couldn't. And my justification for continuing to drink was this, I need to drown my sorrows. But lo and behold, I discovered a new thing. I discovered that my sorrows were brilliant swimmers. They couldn't get drowned. I would drink that night and they would resurface the next morning. Only thing, the intensity would be much stronger. That was my situation. But even as I read my Bible, I came across this passage of Philip in the book of Acts having this discussion with the Ethiopian. And Philip is kind of explaining the scriptures to the Ethiopian. And at the end of that, of that discussion, the Ethiopian asked Philip a question. He looks him in his eye perhaps and said, what stops me from taking baptism? And that was a question that, that verse literally jumped out of the Bible for me. Because a couple of years ago, everybody in my family took baptism. But you know, I was trying to be extra smart and extra wise and I said, hey, until God speaks to me, I'm not going to take. You guys want to take, you take, is what I told my family. But when I read that passage that day, this verse jumped out. But my life was a mess and I realized baptism was a sacred thing. So I said, God, you know, you know I, I, I hear what you're saying, but you know, I don't think I'll be able to do it. I need to clean up before I can come to you. But the word of God was clear. He said, just obey. I realized one lesson in life at that point in time. You don't rationalize. You don't question. When God asks you to do something, you just obey. So in the first week of August 1997, I obeyed God in the waters of baptism. And I want to tell you, that very same day, it's difficult to articulate, it's difficult to explain, but hey, this is exactly what happened. The bondage over the addiction of alcohol, which enslaved me over so many years, was broken just in a flash. And ever since that, I could feel the tangible hand of God over my life. God blessed me with a beautiful partner, Judith, and three beautiful children. I was a loner until then, but God now established me with a family. God led me beautifully in, my, in a career. He got me to work in some of the leading business conglomerates in the, in the country. You know, he, I started at grassroots level, but God took me right up to a CXO level. God has given me the opportunity to sit across the table, not to boast, but I'm, gonna, I, I'm boasting about my Jesus. Jesus made me sit across the table with Mr. Kumar Mangalam Birla and actually make a presentation and give him some recommendations. I never in my wildest dream imagined that was possible. God has made me sit before the, the managing director of the, of the Tata company and give my views. Why am I saying this? I'm saying this that man may estimate you and say, maybe he can fit this bill. But God's plans are exceedingly, abundantly more than you can even ask or think of. That is the God whom we serve. For colleagues and peers, I have people who, who worked their way out and studied so hard and, hard and graduated from the IITs and the IIMs, Ivy Leagues, and I look at myself as somebody who has, who's really a nobody, but I've got a God who can lift people up from the miry clay and set them on the rock to stay. So friends, what am I trying to say? Not bad for a guy who was estimated to just be a PT master. So why did God do what he did to me? Why did he give me the success? Why did he give me a job and a career growth that I never even dreamt of? Was it just to prove a point to everybody who, you know, who, who treated me badly and who didn't think too much of me? Did God bless me on my job to give me the money which I could use to explore the world and to spend lavishly? Was that the reason why God blessed me? 
Why did God give, bless me with a great job and a career? Was it to rub shoulders with the rich and the famous and the influential? I want to tell you the answer to these questions is a resounding no. That was not the reason. I want to present before you a few reasons, I think, why God blesses us with a good job and a great career. I think reason number one is this, that we would be people who, who chase and pursue after our divine purpose, then run after fleeting success, which is temporary and at best illusionary. I want to tell you that when God, you know, when God formed us in our mother's womb, you know, he ingrained in us a divine intent specific to each of us. And that divine intent is commonly called as purpose. And it's when you engage with your purpose that you engage with that divine intent. The fact that you are alive right now, your heart is beating and you're breathing right now is because there's a divine assignment that you need to accomplish for the kingdom of God with God's help. You know, success is good, but you can be successful but not purposeful. But when you are purposeful, you will always be successful. Hey, this is what it is. You know, careers are what you are paid for. But purpose is the reason why God made you. The thing about it is this. 2016 was perhaps the most turbulent years that we have witnessed as a family. I've got twin daughters and one of my daughters fell sick. She had a near-death experience. You know, she had a growth and we went for a surgery to remove that growth. And the surgery and the stay in the hospital was just meant to be seven days. But instead of seven days, she was in hospital 90 days. Instead of one surgery, she had five surgeries. Five times she was on a, you know, a life support system. And on June 21st night of 2016, there was a knock on my door. And I opened the door and I was asked to rush to the ICU. Went to the ICU and the HOD of the ICU looked me point blank in my eye and said, look at your daughter, she's unwell. She's not going to make it tonight. Be prepared for the worst. That was the situation. But you know, and as, and as I stayed in the hospital then, I heard God speak to me once again. And this is what he said. It was a voice which seemed to be urgent. And his words were as follows. He said, Rajiv, Life is uncertain. Life is short. Don't waste your time running after the temporal. Chase after the eternal. Don't waste another minute not living out your purpose. I realized that my purpose is to speak, inspire, and teach. And therefore, I quit my job as, at a CXO level. People said, you're crazy to do this. Great job, good money, fabulous organization. And to top it all, your daughter isn't well. Why are you doing this? But I know that my God has asked me to go after my purpose. So I do my purpose on a 24 by 7 basis, which is to speak, inspire, and teach. And with a portion of the revenue that we get, we invest it back into children, underprivileged kids who are fighting cancer. So that is purpose. Purpose. If you're not living your purpose, you're wasting your time. The second reason why God blesses us with a great career and a great job is that we may influence our supervisors, our peers, our colleagues and, drive and, and point them to the direction of Jesus Christ who has the power to transform any life. You know, when I look at my life and the mess that I was, it was Jesus who transformed me. I had no hope, but today he's, he's using me to give others hope when I talk about Jesus. You know, I... I was a loser, but today I'm part of, of the winning team of my Lord and Savior. You know, Jesus has the power to transform. Then how can you and me be quiet? And how do you bring, out, bring about this? How do you point others to Jesus? It is through our lifestyle. It is through our choices. And it's through our character. Yes, words are important. We need to tell them about Jesus. But I love this quote of Francis the St. Francis who says, always preach the gospel, use words only when needed. And that's what we really need to do. I want to tell you that a lifestyle, a good lifestyle, a Christ-centered lifestyle can influence the lives of so many, more than 100 sermons which are eloquently preached. You need a good lifestyle. 
you know it's important that how you respond to the adversity in life because when the way you respond to adversity in life will attract the attention of your acquaintances when my daughter was critical my colleagues asked me how can you say so calm and composed hey that was a great opportunity that was the question that was the moment i could then point them to my prince of peace who gives me the peace that passes all understanding <laughs> you know you got to stand for your convictions it's one thing to start to talk about integrity it's another thing to live out integrity you know we have this policy in in office where you're given 20000 rupees of conveyance you provide the bills and it's tax free now even if i drive my car morning to night every day for one month i'm not going to get there so my actual conveyance is only 5000 rupees so i started claiming that 5000 rupees much to the dismay of my colleagues they said hey what is wrong with you this is your entitlement i said no it's not right this is what i use this is what i'm going to claim the balance will be taxed so be it my conscience is clear my hands are clean my god is pleased <laughs> i'm not saying this to boast please don't mistake me it's not about me it's about god but when you when you when you have that conviction and when you practice that conviction i want to tell you that is when people start to take notice of your faith and take your faith seriously the third thing that you got to do is you're called not to just exist but to excel that's what you got to do you're not called to exist but to excel i love the way jesus coins it he just he hits the nail on his head when he says this let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father in heaven you're called to excel and you excel by creating value you know if you are a value creator you are somebody who's wanted in an organization if you are a value creator i want to tell you that that no recession can threaten your job you don't need to be a problem pointer anybody can pro- point to problems but you and me as bible believing christians are called to be problem solvers solution makers that is who you and me are called to be how do you create value if i have to answer that question in in one in one line it's quite simple just live what the word of god tells you when you practice living the word of god and not just knowing the word of god you create value you create value with in every interaction and every transaction where your intent is to give and not just to get the more you give the more value you create you create value by living a life of excellence you know a couple of week ago last sunday around 7:45 pm my my daughter jessica the other twin she comes to me and says pa i have a project to complete can you help me you know like i was a great student good thing that she doesn't know about my history but i gave her a, a very good fatherly advice i said what were you doing all saturday what were you doing now why last minute go do it yourself if only she spoke to my teachers it would have been a different story but thank god for small mercies so anyway so she went in hurried did some projects she came back and showed it to me and she said pa what do you think i said it's okay but it's not excellent and as i said those words an alarm bell rang off in my head and the question i asked myself is how often am i doing excellent and how often am i doing okay you know when you practice excellence and i want to tell you as a bible believing christian excellence is a mandatory criteria it is not an option you got to practice excellence how do you create value you create value by doing extra you know i love it i my my personal favorite hero in the bible is joseph okay he he is my ultimate you know role model if i have to use the word i mean he's rushed out of prison the only thing that he does before he's rushed rushed out of prison is to have a shave he's standing in front of pharaoh pharaoh says interpret my dreams the task that was given to him the brief that was given to him was interpret these dreams joseph interpreted the dreams but didn't stop there he said there's going to be this famine it's going to be seven years of plenty famine's going to happen take and save during the years of plenty build a storehouse keep it there find somebody who's an able administrator and let him look after this place and and how this whole process goes he went 
beyond. He did the extra, and therefore, you know, he was appointed as the second most important person in the most powerful uh, nation of that time, which was Egypt. Are you doing extra? You know, we got to be doing extra. If you're asked for a report, don't just give the report. Give the interpretation and give your recommendation. Do extra. And that's how you actually create value. So, and finally, why does God bless us with great jobs and a good career? I, I strongly believe that God blesses us with great jobs and a, strong and a good career is that you and me can be his glory carriers, that we can carry the glory of Jesus and point everybody back to Jesus. That is what you and me are called for. The book of Daniel talks about this. For those who know their God will do great exploits. You know, we got to be pointing back to Jesus. But the question that we need to ask ourselves is this. Am I so busy building fame and po popularity for myself or am I redirecting back the glory to Jesus? Or worse still, am I reflecting my heavenly father in such a poor way by, by my mindset of mediocrity or even average? I want to tell you that your mandate as a believer is to excel and not just to exist. It's not about making up the numbers, but it's about setting the benchmark. It's not about average, being average, but it's about being a pioneer and a trend setter. So in conclusion, this is what I want to tell you. God uses different experiences. He also uses adversity. And in my experience, I want to tell you that God often uses adversity as a platform for promotion. We are so used to thinking prosperity is a, is a platform for promotion, but God works in different ways. He often uses adversity as a platform for promotion. I don't know where you are in life. Maybe you're going through a period of adversity right now, but that just may be the platform that God is using. I want to tell you that God has blessed you with a good job and a career, not so much to make money, to get rich and to fam be famous, but to be His ambassador. I want to tell you this, that your sphere of work is your mission field. And you are a missionary appointed by God to all those people who are within your circle of influence. I got a minute and 37 seconds. And I want to close by just giving you this verse in John chapter 15 and verse 16 where Jesus says this, You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to bear fruit, fruit that will last. I want to tell you, my brother, my sister, my friend, that you are chosen by God, and it just doesn't end there. You have an appointment by God. And every appointment has an assignment. And this assignment is to bear fruit, high quality fruit, fruit that will last. I want to close. I promise you this time I'm closing. I've said this three times already. But the, you know, being a, Christ, being a follower of Christ, I want to be careful what words I use. Being a follower of Christ is an incredible privilege. It's a massive honor, but I want to tell you, it's a great responsibility. That is what it is to be a follower of Christ. So he, uh, thank you for being a great audience, and go out and chase your God-given purpose. God bless. Praise God. Why don't we do this? Why don't we stand up and give an applause to Rajiv Chaladurai? Thank you. I want you to do it so also you'll stretch a little bit, but Thank uh, you. what an amazing uh, testimony. And uh, your life really epitomizes the verse that you quoted, that God can do exceedingly, abundantly, more than you can wish and hope Amen. for. God bless you and your life and your family. We have Pratik and Nerti coming in and giving you a memento that uh, we hope will not be extra baggage for you because you didn't <laughs> plan to be in lead talks when you came in Chennai. Thank you. So but you know, there's a pun everywhere. And this Great one says, so Rajiv Cheladure, Thank you. Thank you so much. pundit. Yeah. That's what it says, yeah. Rajiv Cheladure, the pundit. Let's give him a big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rajiv. God bless you. And you know, every time you said you're going to close, I was hoping in my heart that you don't, because it was so powerful.